Welcome to the panel discussion, Emancipation Day in Florida, presented as part of the Florida Historical Society 2021 Virtual Public History Forum. Emancipation Day in Florida is May 20th, 1865. So it was 156 years ago from the day that this presentation is first being uh, presented to the public. I'm Ben Broatmarkle. I'm executive director of the Florida Historical Society. I'm producer and host of the radio program, Florida Frontiers, the weekly radio magazine of the Florida Historical Society, and our public television series, Florida Frontiers. And my books include Crossing Division Street and Oral History of the African American Community in Orlando. And I'm very pleased to be moderating a panel discussion with a very distinguished panel today. And rather than just uh, read their, their resumes to you, I want to ask them questions about the organizations and associations they've had for many years. First, Alphamese Barnes founded the John G. Riley Museum in 1996 and served as its executive director through 2014. Under her leadership, a visitor center was constructed adjacent to the house and she left a $900,000 endowment to protect the museum's future, which is the best thing any executive director could do. Uh, so Alphamese Barnes, welcome. And tell us a little bit about who John G. Riley was and the house museum that you founded. Okay, John G. Riley, John Gilmore Riley, was born in Lynn County, September 24th, 1857. And he was born into slavery in a downtown location behind the Nod House. Um, um, John Riley went on after slavery to pursue education for a career and became the first African-American principal of Lincoln High School, which was located over on Brevard Street. It was one of the first three freedmen schools built in the state of Florida. He served as principal for 26 years, and during that time also amassed a lot of real estate, 50 parcels of real estate. Well, his home is still standing at 419 East Jefferson Street in a community that was known as Smoky Hollow. It was a thriving African-American community. And um, he, in addition to that, he went about the South establishing CME churches, what have you. And he was grand high priest of the Royal Art Masons of Florida a great man. Because his house was in the way or was subject to being demolished in the 1970s, a group of local citizens came together and raised enough money to buy the house back from the city for back taxes and decided that his house did not need to be destroyed. It should not be destroyed because of all the things he had accomplished. So they were able to save the house. And then, as you said, in 1996, I was a member of that first group, the younger member. And of course they elected me secretary. So that too is why I ended up with a lot of the history about not only Riley, but that first foundation, John G. Riley Foundation. So when I retired from state government in 1995, I decided to do what that original group wanted to have happen, which was to have the Riley House serve the community as a resource but they did not live long enough or were in too ill health to do it. So I stepped in as executive director. I served for 24 years, just stepped away to Emeritus September 28th, 2020, served on the Institute of Museum and Library Board of Directors appointed by Barack Obama, got some things done there, and the rest is moving forward history into where we are today. Great, and I, and I wanna mention very briefly, uh, I came to interview you in, I think it was 2013 at the John G. Riley House Museum. And you had another appointment before our meeting. And, and so I was you know, walking around just checking out the exhibits and I, I poked my head in a darkened room just to see what was in there. And an automatronic robot of John G. Riley started telling me about the, the, uh, the value of reading. And, and I'm glad nobody else was there at the time because I about jumped out of my skin. But it was, it was a great, uh, great feature for, for the, uh, the museum. But in 1997, you also established the Florida African American Heritage Preservation Network. Uh, tell me about that organization. Okay, in 1997, of course, with my first year, I learned a lot. I was a music major and a civil rights administrator for the state, so I knew nothing about museum management and what have you. But I noticed as I went about in every grant opportunity room, um, educational setup, 
I was the only African-American in the audience along with Miss uh, Pinckney from Miami, usually with the Hampton House. And so it's, it, I knew because I had served as secretary for 14 years with the Florida State NAACP, I knew that there were other museums out there trying to preserve this history. So that led me to say, you know, we need to come together and come out of the shadows and become a very viable part of what is happening in the preservation of African-American history. So we came together in 1997, had a big conference here in Tallahassee. Over 125 people came, which was phenomenal at that time. And from that, we had 30 to 35 museums to join the network. And we have functioned since 1997. Uh, Mr. Gary is one of the network um, of members with the Moore Center. And we just keep in touch with each other. We do technical assistance, professional development. Many of them, 20, got their first computers in 2008 because of the network. We were able to get a grant. And so they got their first computer and we sent a technician to each museum. They are from Pensacola through to Miami. And we sent a technician to set up the computer and train them on how to use it. And many still marvel at the fact that they were finally able to surf the net or they were on the information highway, as we were saying during that time. And as you alluded to, you also had a 30-year career with uh, Florida's uh, Departments of Education and, and Labor. Tell us a little bit about what you were able to accomplish there. With Florida Department of Labor, I was a counselor for welfare mothers. There was a new program called the WIN program. And so I worked the the region of Panhandle region, working with welfare mothers and fathers to get them training, um, on the job training, as well as some education. And many of those persons had only prime tobacco or worked in motels, hotels, but we ended up with dental chap, um, chair side assistants and nurses and state workers and what have you. That was um, with the Department of Labor. Then with Department of Education, I carried the piece that I also carried at Department of Labor, which was to um, address inequities, gender, race, disability, what have you, and travel the state monitoring educational systems for equity compliance and investigating complaints of discrimination. And I did that for five years and then that's, I retired at 30 years. They tried to get me to stay. So even if you do part time, I said, no, nah, I think it's time. Well, uh, Jarvis Rozier uh, is Civil War Heritage Coordinator at the John G. Riley House Museum uh, and does annual reenactments of uh, Emancipation Day. Uh, Mr. Rozier, if you would tell us a little bit about uh, what, what you do. Glad to be here. Um, glad to be a part of this panel. Um, I'm Jarvis Rozier, I'm retired Command Sergeant Major, uh, Army, 34-year veteran of the military. I retired in 2009 and started working with the John Gimmo Riley Museum of African American History and Culture here in Tallahassee. Um, we kind of partnered, the museum partnered with the Leon Rifles um, to do a reenactment at the Battle of Natural Ridge. The Battle of Natural Ridge is being reenacted for over 33 years, but not a participation of an actual African-American regiment that fought down there. So that's where the vision came from with Ms. Barnes and the museum to work with the um, historical society, uh, Natural Ridge Historical Society. So I put together a Civil War reenactment unit, um, the 2nd Infantry Regiment, United States Colored Troop, reenactment unit, the Living History Association. Our mission is to preserve, protect, promote, educate, and interpret the accomplishment of the many African-Americans that fought during the Civil War. Like you said, I'm the Civil War Heritage Coordinator for the museum and my historical uh, points pretty much during the Civil War era. Uh, the group that I'm speaking of, we do reenactments, Civil War reenactments, living history presentations, school presentations, lectures, um, presentation speeches, and things of that nature. We've did over uh, 200 events in the past um, 10 years of our existence. So that's been pretty busy doing that. I am um, working with the museum and working with the Florida African American Heritage Preservation Network, pretty much telling the story of the many African Americans that fought during the Civil War. Um, 
many people aren't aware that over 209,000 by the end of the Civil War, the uh, Union forces were made up of over one-tenth um, African Americans. So uh, a lot of people aren't sure, we didn't know that until probably they saw the movie Glory uh, that opened the eyes of people letting them know that uh, actually African Americans fought during the Civil War, actually African Americans fought during the Revolutionary War. Um, there was never a problem with them fighting, it was just being allowed to fight. Um, so basically the Emancipation Proclamation changed um, the Civil War in itself because the Emancipation Proclamation that um, was enacted in September 22 of 1862 and then signed by Abraham Lincoln in January 1 of 1863. Um, Abraham Lincoln was a politician and uh, he was being pushed by his generals, um, Frederick Douglass, a big orator and abolitionist that we know of, letting them know that um, it would be in his va favor of the Union to um, free the African-Americans. They would probably come over to the Union side, they would flee the plantations, and that's pretty much what happened. Jarvis Rozier, you, you, you've also worked to identify uh, unmarked graves of, of Civil War soldiers, right? Tell me about that. Yeah, that's correct. Um, working with the, um, with the museum, we've identified 31 graves at the Old City Cemetery that we're working to identify um, of Union soldiers, United States colored troop soldiers as well. Um, there's a, uh, a ceremony that we do each May 20th, celebrating Emancipation Proclamation, where we uh, commemorate those soldiers. So we're working on that project as well. I think we have identified as well about 11 now, and we're working to identify others because we have to make sure records are correct and we want to be authentic in what we're doing. Bill Gary is president of the Harry T. and Harriet B. Moore Cultural Complex in MIMS, the Moors became the first martyrs of the contemporary civil rights movement when a bomb exploded out of their home in Mims, Florida on Christmas night, 1951. Uh, Bill Gary, tell us a little bit about uh, the Moors and the, the Moore Cultural Complex. Uh, the Harry T. and Harry B. Moore Cultural Complex uh, Board of Directors, uh, of which I serve as president, um, it, it's charged with uh, raising funds uh, and uh, providing physical enhancements and uh, cultural programs there at the Moore Cultural Center. Um, it was established in 2002, and I've been serving as president since 2005. And over that time, uh, we've made a number of strides, I believe, uh, in terms of making the public, the general public aware uh, and educating the general public about uh, Harry and Harriet Moore and, and their role in the civil rights movement here in the state of Florida. Uh, through uh, legislative grants, we were able to build a, a replica of the Moore home that was bombed uh, Christmas night, 1951. Uh, we have built uh, two reflecting pools uh, with flowing fountains, uh, a gazebo that's used for a number of different kinds of programs as well as weddings. And uh, we built a community pavilion that's used mainly for class reunions, family reunions and such. Um, inside the, the Culture Center and Museum, uh, we've added some displays. Um, as it turns out, um, I was uh, a few weeks ago uh, in Orlando, uh, at a um, display case warehouse uh, looking for some uh, display cases because we want to uh, display some of the letters uh, that Harry Moore wrote, uh, as well as we received a large shipment of uh, dirt. And this dirt uh, had been um, scooped up and taken to the FBI laboratory in Virginia uh, it's part of the uh, last um, investigation of the bombing of the Moore home. Uh, once they finished, uh, after they had finished with their analysis and so forth, uh, they sent the dirt to us and it's in bags. And so we want to take some of that dirt, which came from around the home and nearby and display it in some uh, glass jars. So we're going to put those in, uh, in the... Uh, in the uh, museum. Along with that, uh, we have a couple other displays. One of them uh, will uh, identify May 20th as e Emancipation Day here in the state of Florida. Uh, we've also uh, written a letter to our 
uh, County Commission Board uh, requesting that they pass a resolution uh, recognizing and identifying May 20th as Emancipation Day uh, in the state of Florida. Yeah. Uh, along with that, over the years, uh, we have uh, been able to get a display of the moors uh, installed in the Smithsonian Natu uh, National Museum of African American uh, History and Culture in Washington, D.C., along with a number of other uh, buildings and roads and so forth that was named after the moors. So uh, at our latest uh, venture, uh, which just happened a few, well, a month or so ago, uh, was that the Bavard uh, Public School Board passed a resolution that uh, publicly apologized for the firing of the Moors back in 1946 and reinstated them as teachers emeritus forever in the uh, Bavard Public School System. Along with that, uh, it identified that every year, eighth graders will go on a field trip to the Moore Cultural Center and Museum, and that a uh, Harry T. and Harry B. Moore legacy curriculum will be developed and taught to all uh, Bavard Public School students. Um, we just met yesterday, uh, the first time the, the curriculum team uh, and went through, you know, our plan for developing this. We we are looking to have this done by mid summer, and it will be implemented in the fall. So they will begin teaching uh, the history of the Moors uh, through the grades uh, in Bavard County uh, this fall. So that's one of our latest thing. And then, of course, uh, we are collaborating with Dr. Ben and the Florida Historic Society on putting together something to. Uh, let people know that May 20th is really the official Emancipation Day in Florida and not June, uh, Juneteenth, as many think. Right, and, and of course, Harry T. and Harriet B. Moore were both educators and uh, activists throughout the state of Florida, registered uh, over 100,000 people to vote. Uh, they, they were very active, and, and he also founded the Brevard County branch of the NAACP, and uh, right. Bill Gary, you've been active with a variety of groups, uh, but you also kind of stepped into Harry T. Moore's shoes uh, in that you were president of the North Brevard County NAACP, right? Yes, uh, I've served as, I've served as president um, of the North Brevard branch of NAACP. Actually, my first um, entry into that, um, believe it or not, was um, 1979. Uh, when myself and a group of other people here locally um, decided to apply for a charter uh, for North of Art, uh, NAACP. Uh, there had been some other branches here uh, uh, since the uh, original Bavard County branch. And the, the, the first person that was uh, selected as president only served about six months. And so I was cast um, unexpectedly into the role of president in 1980. Uh, and I served my first, um, I guess, tenure of about 10 years and uh, just got burnt out uh, because at that time uh, we were really active. We, we did uh, voter registration, we did vote education, we was involved with the public school system, uh, trying to uh, uh, get more uh, African Americans hired, uh, not only as teachers, but also as, as staff persons there in the school district. Um, I took a break for uh, a little while and, and got involved in some other things. And uh, the, the branch became inactive. Our state president contacted me and said, you know, I'd like for you to uh, reactivate the branch, get the branch going again. So I took it on again. Uh, we were awarded uh, two national awards um, at the National Convention. We, we uh, received an award uh, in 1986 for our uh, programming activities, and we received an award in 2003 when the National Convention was held in, uh, in Miami. Uh, but in, in 2013, the National NAACP Convention was held in Orlando. And we had a uh, 
huge exhibit um, that was made really out of plywood, very hairy, but I was able to get that uh, copied onto a thin cardboard. And so we, we had a display about Harry T. Moore uh, at the National Convention, the first time that's ever been done there. Uh, over in Orlando at the uh, Orange County Convention Center. And so we were very proud to be able to put together that kind of uh, exhibit uh, for all those delegates to see those who knew and those who were unfamiliar with the Moors got a chance to see that. So um, we, we've, we've tried to work uh, diligently uh, in promoting uh, the legacy of the Moors. And of course, uh, Mrs. Bonds, we've been a part of the uh, Florida African-American Heritage Preservation Network uh, for a number of years there and uh, been uh, greatly benefited. Uh, probably one of the most benefits that we've received from that, not only as an organization, but also personally was in 2009, uh, when Dr. Lonnie Bunch was in Jacksonville, uh, visiting Florida, uh, looking at places and things that would become part of the new National Museum. And Mrs. Bunch uh, contacted me and invited me to come up and make a presentation uh, to Dr. Bunch, uh, which ultimately led to uh, a display being in the uh, National Museum. So Mrs. Bunch, I thank you so much. And I tell people all the time, that was what led to the Moors being on a national stage now and people from all over the world knowing about them. Well, great. Well, before we move on, I also want to mention that uh, in addition to all the great work you've done with not-for-profits and community organizations, you worked at the, the Kennedy Space Center for, for 35 years. Yes, uh, I guess <laughs> I, I, since I was retired and, and I, you know, my, my civic life has been so full uh, since basically that I, I came to Florida uh, after graduating from college that sometimes I, I just really forget that I, I work for NASA. But uh, my, my degree, uh, and this is kind of a dichotomy thing, my uh, undergraduate degree is in electrical engineering. Uh, so when I finished college, I, I began working for NASA uh, in the electrical branch. And, and that was during the time that we was just beginning to modify facilities and build uh, support equipment for the space shuttle program. So I worked through that uh, for about 20 years. I, I spent a year in Washington, DC at NASA headquarters, learning about all the different programs, uh, learning about the federal budget and how NASA plays into that and how we build up a budget to be included with the president's submission, uh, came back and um, uh, landed a job in the International Space Station Directorate, uh, working with our international partners. And uh, that's where I retired, uh, uh, working uh, import export compliance uh, and uh, station logistics. Uh, so I I've had a really good career, uh, you know, being paid for it, but I probably worked more uh, put in more hours actually uh, in volunteer work there because they, it never ends. Uh, when you are president of the NAACP, you, I mean, it's weekends are just like every other work day there. You know, things happen, you get calls, there's work to be done. Uh, and uh, as president of the Moore Cultural Complex Board, um, we spend many times uh, working, doing stuff out there on the weekend, getting prepared, ready for a program or something. Um, and so it, uh, it, it goes on, but it's very satisfying. It's been very satisfying to see things, getting to know Evangeline Moore, uh, her son and, and her grandson, um, who were both part of the um, uh, resolution that was passed by the school board. Uh, we had them at the ceremony uh, via Zoom. And uh, to see that family um, finally uh, get some sense that there is a, a appreciation uh, for the work that their grandparents did and, and died for, 
Uh, I know for Evangeline, uh, when we built the replica house, uh, before we opened it to the public, we took her on a private tour and she was very moved by that because that was the first time she could say that she had come home. Uh, so uh, those things are just really gratifying and, 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 you know, no amount of money really takes that away. Well, thank you. Uh, Bob Holliday is president of the Tallahassee Historical Society. Uh, tell us a little bit about that organization. Thank you, Ben. The Tallahassee Historical Society is the second oldest behind the Florida Historical Society, second oldest historical society in the state. We were founded in 1933, so I guess we're in our 88th year. Um, our mission, our, our, mesh, our mission is primarily educational, I, I would say. We do get involved in some questions of historic preservation and, and, and issues like that. But we meet, uh, we meet the second Thursday of every month between October, between October and May. We've had, uh, we've had uh, members of the legislature and governors and senators be, be, be members. And we've always kept very much of a low profile. And um, I think we're beginning to raise our profile a little bit, which is kind of, which is kind of pleasing. They asked me to be president uh, three three years ago, and I, I I like to joke to them, and it's not really a joke that they've never had a president who actually knows less about Tallahassee history than I do. I've only I haven't lived here that long, but um, but it's a very fine organization, and um, and uh, we we uh, we like to work with partners like the Florida uh, like the Florida Historical Society. Well, you're, you're also a journalist with the, the Tallahassee Democrat and the Florida Phoenix. Tell me a little bit about. Well, I've, I've written some stuff for them. I'm originally from Middle Tennessee, um, up, up in Nashville, and I, and, and I was a journalist before I moved down here in, in 2000, wrote for a lot of publications up there, and then was also a PR flack for the, for the, for the, for the city of Franklin. But yeah, I've written a, a fair number of articles. I mean, one of the things that I have sort of found myself doing the last few years is being an informal lobbyist, to emphasize informal lobbyist on the subject of, of civic literacy and what, 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 um, what students should know as far as, as civics and, and its component parts, which are government, our government in history. And so I've, I've, um, uh, I'm currently within 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 striking distance. I'll put it this way: of finally getting a a, a bill through the legislature that would require that would require uh, post secondary students to 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 take civics coursework, of which history is of which history is one part. There's no statewide, and and you know we talked about this last year. There's there is no statewide history requirement at the post-secondary level for, for students. And when the legislature nine years ago um, put a limit on the number of general education hours that, a, that, a, that an institution could require, it, it made it easy for a lot of them to drop their own individual history requirements. And so we've been scrambling ever since. Um, we've been scrambling ever since to make them see the importance that, that, you, that you really do need to have some history instruction in the colleges and, and universities, and we're close. We're 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 awfully close. And I've written a good I've written a good bit about that. And so, that also comes out of your work as uh, uh, teaching American history at the, at the college level. I do, I do. I've, for fifteen years, I've been teaching American history at Tallahassee Community College, and uh, uh, I must say, it's 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 an extremely a uh, pleasurable place to work. I mean, they 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 give you a great deal of autonomy, um, a great deal of autonomy there. Well, for at least the past thirty years, uh, people have become very aware of Juneteenth, and that celebration is meant to commemorate uh, when on June nineteenth in Galveston, Texas, uh, the last enslaved people found out that they had been freed by the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, they were supposedly the last in the United States to find out. Uh, they were in Galveston, Texas, and, and again, June 19th is the date. But the date is different 
here in Florida. Uh, Alphamese Barnes, you remember celebrating Emancipation Day in Florida as a child, uh, which recognized the date May 20th, 1865, right? That is correct. I grew up in the May 20th celebrations. In fact, from the day that I knew myself, we would go back into the country where my parents came from and attend these celebrations. Uh, to, to kind of go back a little bit, my great grandparents were in slavery. And of course they passed down the stories to their parents and then to my mother and father. My, my father, after slavery and everything moved along, became a sharecropper. He was a member of a sharecropper family. And my mother on Wheelawney Plantation in Tallahassee. And then my mother's father was caretaker over on Waverly Plantation. So my parents believed a lot in educating and making sure we knew why things were happening as they were not in a bitter way, but just so we would be aware. And in fact, until fifth grade, I attended the uh, Griffin School that was founded by the Black Primitive Baptists. And we always were out on May 20th. People didn't come to work. My father didn't go to work. Other Blacks in the community, that was a day to take off, prepare, and go back into the country to celebrate. So it's, it's always been a part of my life. I also knew that not only were we, that was that happening in Tallahassee, but, but because I came from such a large family, there were 12 on my mother's side as far as her siblings, seven on my father's side, they moved to other parts of the state and they too were involved in celebrating the Emancipation Proclamation. So to be honest, I didn't hear about June 19th to really internalize it or pay that much attention, probably until within the last three to four or five years at best. So um, it, it, it really kind of got to me when last year I received a call from someone that our county commission was proposing to make June 19th a national holiday. And I'm what, why, why are we doing this? And so that kind of got everything kicked off and people started picking up the phone and calling their commissioners and saying, why is this happening? So in the end, they heard us and they may or may put the history together. And then the Tallahassee Historical Society came along. Of course, Clifton and Jarvis, our historians were there and Commissioner Diane Cox and everybody. And so in the end, the Council on Culture and Arts, so in the end, the county said, well, we understand we are moving in the wrong direction. So in September of 2020, they passed a resolution giving a paid holiday to county employees. Then Commissioner Diane Cox carried it to the city and Mayor John Daly and said, look, the county is doing this and we need to recognize this history as the capital city and county, we need to lead the way. And so then the next month, the city did the same thing. So this May 20th, the city and county employees have a paid holiday off. We are organizing the virtual state and John Gilmore Riley annual um, celebration, virtual. And the United States Colored Troops, as Jarvis said, we would do the opening ceremony, but the city is also planning to do a festival of sorts that will help commemorate this day. And they have a television channel, a TV channel that we are working toward getting it placed on that channel. So that's kind of how all of this came about. And then the next thing I knew I'm looking in Florida statue and there is this statement that says in 1991, one of our senators proposed legislation, it was adopted and in our Florida statute is saying that June 19th will be a legal holiday upon which we will recognize that slaves in Florida were free I'm saying, well, where did that come from? How did that come about? It's incorrect. So, and then 
as the session was about to start this year, I got a call, hey, there's a bill, a Senate bill and a House bill that's proposing to declare June 19 as the official date when slaves in Florida were freed and they want to make it a national holiday. Duh, couldn't do that. It would, you know, so I just started making contact with different people and others would call me and say, well, why is this happening? And so we've kind of now formed a nucleus of people. It's probably about 15 of us, plus the, all the museums and the network across the state. And we're saying, you know, we need to give a heavy lift to this because we don't want our children mistaught. We don't, we need to educate obviously a lot of our adults and we certainly in Florida statute and we don't want our governor to be embarrassed or not on the right page. So we've just moved forward from that with uh, our advocacy and what we have been asking for, if it can't be corrected, we hope it can be this session but if not, don't approve it. And let's have like a year long emancipation education campaign, just as you raise money, let's do an educating about that whole emancipation process because it had impact across the whole nation. Sure, and, and to that point, uh, Jarvis Rozier, uh, the emancipation of enslaved people during and after the Civil War was, was a long and, and complex process. Can you provide us with an overview of that process nationally and in Florida? Okay, yeah, the Emancipation Proclamation, um, a little history about that. When it came to Florida nearly two and a half years later, uh, May 20th, 1865, after it was um, signed by Abraham Lincoln in January 1 of 1863, um, like Ms. Barnes has said, the uh, Emancipation Proclamation has always been celebrated here in the state of Florida. Um, by the time it got here, I remember talking to my great grandmother and she used to tell me about her grandmother, which was a slave um, and up in Macon, up in um, Hawkinsville, Georgia near Macon. The first event that my organization did was a Juneteenth event in Macon, Georgia. Um, even though I wasn't aware of a whole lot of things. So I kind of tell people, once I turn over a stone, I see 10 pebbles and it just keeps going and going and going. And I did several Juneteenth events, but I also, when I do an event in the state of Florida, I let them know that our actual history is May 20. And that's what we're trying to make sure that it's done. I've always said, I know Texas is a big state, but it doesn't reach the Atlantic to the Pacific. So Texas has its own right to celebrate Juneteenth, but that was when General Granger came into Texas and Galveston, Texas, and they read the General order number three, but that was the, the and, and it's, it's, it's wrong for it to be said and it's, it's inaccurate because one thing I always say, history is not objective, it's definitive. It's definitive history. Florida's history is definitive. May 20th, May 20th is our history. Um, Juneteenth was, and it's, it's been said that Juneteenth was when all the slaves were freed. That's another false. All the slaves were not freed until the 13th Amendment, December 6, 1865. Um, when Juneteenth came about, um, the falsehood that all slaves were free, that still Delaware and Kentucky still held their slaves until the Emancipation Proclamation, parts of um, territories in Oklahoma as well. It was said that Texas was the last of the states, seven states in rebellion, which is true, but it's not the last state uh, that held their slave. But Florida has always been representing that, the Emancipation Proclamation. I remember doing um, planning the Maypole, we've always celebrated. I think it's been celebrated here in Tallahassee since 1867. I think it was Barnes, remember, at Bull Palm, which is called Lake Ella here now. They celebrated that in 1867. They waited two, a year after just to make sure. But it's been celebrated every year. And each year we do the celebration with the commemoration at the cemetery that we mentioned, where my unit does um, 21 gun salute. And we play taps to commemorate those soldiers that gave so much. And also we do the reading of the reenactment at the Knot House where General McCook came down on, um, December, on January 10th and read, the, I mean, March, May 10th and read the Emancipation on the 20th. So the history that we're talking about, it, it, would, be, it would be sad to see our grandchildren look back at our history and say, why is there Juneteenth? And we're setting, celebrating May 20th. Juneteenth is a good catchphrase. And that's what it is. And it, it just started catching on throughout the country. That's no problem. Have a picnic, have a cookout, celebrate your history, 
But we in, in Florida should be celebrating May 20th, which is our actual holiday. And it, um, it would be kind of uh, sad if we move forward and celebrate another state's holiday and overlook our own. So it's important that we recognize Emancipation Day of May 20th in Florida. And Bill Gary, uh, Harry P. Moore, of course, as we've talked about, was an educator known for teaching black history before that was even a uh, recognized subject. Uh, why is it important for people in Florida to be aware of this, uh, the correct emancipation date here? Well, I, I think it's important that um, as we uh, have moved into this era of um, reconciliation and also recognizing uh, the history of all people who have contributed uh, to this country is that one of the things um, that we have to do is make sure or ensure that that history is accurate. Uh, as uh, Mr. Rosier uh, mentioned earlier, uh, we are teaching our young people, our students, and certainly we want to teach them the accurate history of our state there. Uh, yes, Juneteenth uh, has a history in the state of Texas and it's recognized there, but we have a history also. And so students in the state of Florida and adults in the state of Florida need to know that May 20th is the emancipation date for those persons who were enslaved in the state of Florida there. Uh, it, it is very important, I believe, that history is portrayed accurately uh, we know now that so much of the history relating to African Americans really have been left out of history books and have been distorted in some cases. So now this is an opportunity for those of us who uh, believe in uh, historical facts uh, to fight to make sure that the history is portrayed accurately. And Bob Holliday, uh, you're active in, in working to move forward legislation and education and, and history topics in Tallahassee. Uh, tell us a little bit more about the effort to officially recognize Emancipation Day in Florida as being May 20th, 1865. By the time this program appears, uh, a bill may or may not have passed the Florida legislature, as Al Tamis said, actually recognizing actually recognizing uh, June 19th, which we have been, which we have been opposing. Um, at our last at our last committee stop, this, the sponsor indicated that he would be up for amending it. Uh, I'm a little bit unclear as to whether he would, whether even in the amendment, it would give May 20th an equal status with June 19th or, or, or not, but that's essentially what has to, what, <clears throat> what has to happen here. I mean, this is, I, I, um, I, 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 I sort of have joked about this throughout the last six months, but one of the I ironic things about this, uh, considering all of our history is that this is really kind of a state's rights issue. I mean, how do individual states and communities, all of which, most of which had different emancipation days, uh, celebrate this? Do we make this? Do we make this uniform across the board, even if it even if it means uh, short shrifting someplace like uh, like like Florida? And uh, I mean, politics is obviously involved in it. You, you get a national holiday. I mean, I, I have uh, I have heard some discussion. I'm trying to phrase this as well as I can. I've heard some discussion that trying to make this a national holiday has something to do with the subject of reparations. Um, I don't know about that, but I have heard that. But I just I just. Um, the best way to do this now, I, th I think, um, is to amend the bill going through the Florida legislature to give May 20th e equal status um, uh, with June with with June 19th. And I mean, do, do the rest of you all agree with that? I'll throw this out to my fellow to my fellow panel members. Is uh, are, do you all think that as well? Alphamese? I will weigh in and say, if 
that is the best option. If we cannot, if the Senator does not, as he said this morning, do an amendment that will take the June 19th date uh, out of the amendment and replace with May 20th, May 20th, 1865 needs to be added into the amendment as one of the legal holidays. They have about seven legal holidays, Christmas, Thanksgiving, something else, June 19th, where May 20th needs to be placed there if that is the alternative of the option. Um, one thing I would like to say too is, and Jarvis, you can help me with this, when Senator Bracey continues to say, well, 40 some states have adopted June 19th as Emancipation Day. Well, emancipation was more specific to the, I think it was 11 states that were in rebellion and had not released the slaves. So places like California, New York, well, all of those are in this 40 something, but as the saying goes, not that they shouldn't do what they're doing, but do they have the same dog in the fight <laughs> as those directly affected by the emancipation? That's mm. why it came about because of the states that were in rebellion. Mm. Senator, Cl I'm not Senator, U.S. Congressman Clyburn two weeks ago just made a statement of concern as well. His question is why should we have a national emancipation holiday based on the history of one state? Mm -hmm. We in our group have talked about maybe a more authentic date and we know it's New Year's Eve but the date that the Emancipation Proclamation was signed, January 1st, 1863, or December 6th, 1865, ratification of the um, 13th Amendment. That's the position of the national NAACP. What I'm saying, that's their position with a written statement. You've got to give the people of Texas credit. They are great salesmen. They are, they, they are great at creating a phrase like Juneteenth and creating these kind of myths and, nas and nationalizing them and so forth. But it's, as, as we have told, I guess at least two legislative committees, you know, as of, as of, as of this date, I mean, the history is just wrong. Well, from an educational standpoint, it, it's clearly important that Floridians know that Emancipation Day in Florida is May 20th and not, not Juneteenth. Uh, but Florida is always focused on, on tourism as well. Does tourism factor into this conversation? That was the comment that I made this morning. When you have a day, national date like that, and my mind went to Essence Festival, where a lot of people flock to Louisiana for Essence. Uh, with the travel and hotel industry being behind this national um, day, Juneteenth, there is the possibility, the potential for Floridians, potential visitors and tourists that might come to Florida to say, hey, we're going to save our money and make our annual holiday to go to this festival in Texas. So as some of my colleagues, including my niece, who's an attorney, kept saying, Auntie, follow the money, follow mm -hmm. the money. So mm -hmm. I think Florida needs to listen. I met with a senator this past summer on this same issue, trying to get him to do an amendment. And he, kind of, he said, I've, I've read your material, and you're right. May 20th is the day for Florida. And he kind of smiled. He said, but guess what? Guess where I was last year, June 19th? He said, I went out to Texas to the festival. Well, what actually happened on uh, May 20th? Uh, the, the, uh, every state had it differently, but there was actually a public proclamation, right? A, 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 a reading. Can, uh, uh, Jarvis, can you tell me what happened? Yeah, that was um, uh, May 20th on the stops of the Hager House, which is now the Knott House, where General McCook came in and actually read the Emancipation Proclamation to the uh, state of Florida, and they lowered the Confederate flag at the state capitol and raised the Union flag. 
and the word went out the second USCT and other units and USCT units and union units went out into the plantations out to the highways and byways to inform the plantations that the African-American slaves were free. So, you know, the problem that we have with the um, Juneteenth, like I said, it's a catchphrase, but just to weigh in on that, December 6th, if we remember when the Emancipation was, uh, Proclamation was signed, there were four border states that did not include that, Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Missouri, Kentucky, Delaware, and Maryland. Um, Maryland Delaware and Kentucky were the last of the slaveholding states now, if the wording, we can work on a compromise, like Ms. Bonds was saying, they're talking about May 20th and Juneteenth, but we can't leave the wording in there to say, I guess I'm just stuck on history uh, being correct, that that was the, the year, June 19th was when all slaves were free. That was just, it's just not correct. And that would be a disservice to all those who gave it all. Like I said, slavery didn't die by natural death. It died by over 622,000 lives that were lost during the Civil War. By the end of the Civil War, it did become uh, about war, about slavery. So we cannot just, I'm, I guess I'm stuck on that part as well, that we can't leave that wording in there, that we can say something that Texas was the last of the slave holding states or in rebellion. Okay, wording has to be correct when we document history and make it a law. I, well, I just want to coattail on what uh, Mr. Rosier is saying there. Um, I, 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 I listened to uh, Mrs. Barnes and I understand uh, her uh, comment, follow the money uh, and how that plays into uh, the actions that politicians take. But uh, I, I am curious as to how they reconcile uh, ignoring historical fact uh, for a, a, a you know, a political um, uh, issue. It, it's, you know, we're talking about uh, teaching history to generations uh, that's coming uh, after us. And I, I just uh, personally uh, would oppose even an amendment to it that uh, did not accurately reflect uh, the date that enslaved people in the state of Florida uh, were freed there. Th there's just no way I could, uh, in good conscience, talk that to someone and says, well, uh, it was because, uh, you know, people wanted to go to a festival on June, uh, June 10th, June 19th in Texas. Uh, you know, let them go, but uh, we, we have to, uh, continue to fight this and, and, and push for uh, the accurate date to, to reflect uh, this particular issue there, because this also is, is around other issues there. And for far too long, much of our history has been distorted uh, and left out of uh, history books. There. So uh, I'm hopeful that we can continue to fight this and, and not let it go forward. And Alphamies Barnes, you, you spoke of celebrating Florida's Emancipation Day on May 20th growing up, but Florida's population is transient. There's people moving in and out every year all the time. Uh, is part of the difficulty getting Emancipation Day in Florida recognized partly uh, an awareness problem? I think that's a part of the problem, awareness, lack of the, the senator who went to Texas last year and said he had a good time. And in fact, his birthday is on May 20th. But um, for him, it was a lack of awareness. And I think so many others. Another thing that I think we need to think about here, and that's why we said to the education campaign, the opportunity to do an education campaign, is that I was asked early on, why should white people care? Um, let black people, that, that's an issue dealing with black. So let the blacks fight it out. But that is not the way I perceive it. And the group, those of us who have been going and fighting this battle, don't all look like me. There's Mr. Holliday, there's Lonnie Mann, there's Beth Civita, there's Mary May. So given where we are today and some of the issues that we have around social justice and healing, I see this kind of a discussion, this kind of an event 
an event, if we get it right, could be that opportunity for us to come together, reflect. Yeah, it was a troublesome and dark time, but even intergenerationally, help the younger people to understand there's a reason why you get out and protest, um, march. Um, why, you know, what's the root of all of this? And I think, I think that this is the best time that we've had to have this come together and this dialoguing around, for some reason that you mentioned, we have different people in the state now open-minded people. Um, so I, I just think it's a good time to, to utilize this event as well to promote this healing and social justice that people talk about and talk about the impact of institutional racism and on and on. Yes, and, and Black history is of course American history. And uh, there are a lot of efforts that are continually being made by a lot of people to tell the full story of our, our, our nation's history. Uh, and you, you've touched on this, but this is, this is for everybody. Uh, why is it important for history uh, education to be inclusive of diverse populations for both our society as a whole and for uh, individuals? Well, I'll, I'll answer, I mean, I'll say that it's, there are so few things in 2021 which unify, and I think getting history right is 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 one of those. I mean, the the May twentieth event in Tallahassee is a is a unifying community event. I mean, there are there are black people there and white people there, um, and it's 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 a unifying event. And as Althami said, yeah you don't try to pretend the darker side of our history did not happen, but this helps us, this helps us recognize that um, and, and, and move and move and move past it. I mean, it's, uh, it's all American history. I mean, it, it is all American history and, and it matters. I would just like it to say that Sometimes it seems like the word emancipation has been used like as a political football. Uh, but the word emancipation means a great deal. And a lot of times when I speak and I talk to young as well as old, you have to change the way you, you get the message across. And I would tell a little black kid as well as a little white kid, close your eyes and just for a second and think that you're at the steps of the knot house and somebody is telling you that after 400 years, you are free. The word emancipation will mean and will stick, it will mean a lot more. So we have to be passionate when we're talking about the word emancipation and the correct dates when we are talking about the emancipation, when we talk about this in our history books and our educational piece. Education is the key for people to be educated. A lot of people that do Juneteenth, they don't know what Juneteenth is about, but they know it's going to be a picnic. They know they're going to have a good time. But emancipation should be passionate when talked about and should be felt as that way in a sense of just the word itself can't be a little football that's kicked around. Just because maybe 40 or 56 states in the nation want to follow Juneteenth, that doesn't mean we have to follow them as well in the state of Florida. Mm -hmm. Well, to, to, go ahead, Alphamese. No, I was just going to say the, the, why it's important for people to be concerned. I, I see it almost as a health issue. Uh, some people in the civil rights era and my job and all, you know, when I would look at them and say, you know, I think a lot of what we are dealing with when it comes to inequity and just straight out real discrimination and segregation is a matter of health. And you can't, it has to be a mental uh, distortion in there or they have these words in the psych psychology thing where you know you are greater than or you are whatever. Um, but to, to hate, to dislike, to hold another down for reasons like skin color or gender or whatever, that's a health issue. And the only thing that will heal that is a psychologist or 
you know, someone specialized in that area, or if we get enough open-minded people to come together to talk, reflect, not angry, out of Riley, we've treated many topics, civil rights, slavery, union army, whatever. Don't do it with anger, but it's to educate. And I think in a way, that's why a lot of people say to me, you know, most of the events at Riley, you have a diversity there, you know, people come together and talk and they want to know more because that's the way uh, we deal with it. It's also a moralistic issue, you know, where are your morals? And I think it's important even from, from very young ages that children come up knowing this history. As my dad with the third grade education used to say and some of my elders, it's okay to know something, to have the knowledge, but above all, get the understanding. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a, a, a good place uh, for us to wrap. Uh, but I, I do want to ask, what can people who are watching this do to help recognize uh, uh, May 20th as Emancipation Day in Florida? How can they help with that effort to make that an official uh, recognition? Well, I would just speak first and then others can add in. There are efforts across the state right now, people organizing to do statewide presentations. We have network museums that are putting on special programs. Um, Many have been celebrating all along, but they are putting in an extra, extra effort to get the promotion and the marketing piece out there. And um, I think we need more of that. We need all groups like the Florida Historical Society to help us reach our elected officials to help them understand this is not a battle for reparation or anything other than let's keep history as it happened. That is a critical tool to not only our school children, our young people, but my experience, and I say it with great passion, it helps us to get along better. Well, thank you so much. I wanna thank our distinguished panel, Alpha Mies Barnes, Jarvis Rozier, Bill Gary and Robert Holiday, uh, and thank everybody who's watching for, for being here. Uh, this has been a presentation on Emancipation Day in Florida as part of the Florida Historical Society 2021 Virtual Public History Forum. Thanks for joining us. I'm Ben Brooke Markle.